All right, everyone, it is uh, 1130 Mountain Time, 1230 Central, and uh, for time's sake, I think we'll go ahead and get started promptly. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and welcome you to Preparing for Stroke Amid COVID-19, a Southwest Region discussion. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'm Stephanie Chapman, and I serve as the Vice President of Quality and Systems Improvement for the Southwest Region of the American Heart Association. We've had a significant response to this call. There are about 250 of you who registered to participate, and we know now that your time more than ever is really precious, and we hope today to use it effectively to, to facilitate conversation, discuss barriers you have encountered or barriers you anticipate, and share what you are doing to continue to provide the best care possible to your stroke patients. I want to take this time to pause and thank you for all you are doing for patients across our region. You have all joined uh, the call today on mute. Please use the chat box for comments and questions and our team will answer your questions or, or share comments. When we pause to take questions or comments verbally, you can also come off of mute on your phone by pressing star six. You can put yourself back on mute by pressing star six again. If you're on a computer, you should see a microphone icon at the bottom of your screen that will take you on and off of mute. With so many people joining us today, please take care to stay on mute when you're not sharing and please remember to not put us on hold so we aren't delayed with hospital messaging or music. If you're having technical difficulties, please email audrey.bell at heart.org. That's again, Audrey, A-U-D-R-E-Y dot bell at heart dot org. <clears throat> so when we refer to the Southwest region of the American Heart Association, we're referencing the region that you now see in red that's made up of the states of Arkansas, Colorado, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, and Wyoming, as that is where most of us on the call today live and work. This data from the New York Times was as of Monday, and it shows a significant difference from region to region. So we come together today in hopes that we can all share what we know and what we've heard from other areas of the country with higher incidence and plan together for the peak uh, that we know is coming. We hope this will be an interactive and full hour. All of your ideas and challenges are important, and we know that you have significant expertise to share. If there's something that we don't get to discuss today and there is interest, we're certainly open to convening again. Just let us know in the chat box at the end of the call if you'd like to do this again. I'd like to start with a couple of updates from the American Heart Association. This depiction is not a comprehensive look at all of the things that the organization is doing, rather a small subset that is most appropriate for our conversation today. We'll go quickly, but the slides will be shared at the completion of the call, so you will have all the links and emails and information. So with your mission critical work in mind, we're making some adjustments to adapt to the current environment. For those of you participating in Get With The Guidelines Stroke, the data submission to complete 2019 data entry has been extended. Although most of you have already completed your data entry, if you have not, the deadline is now April 30th. If you need additional time after April 30th, we will work with you. Just reach out to your local QSI director. Later this month, data collection elements will be added to get with the guidelines to address COVID-19. You'll find these additional data elements in the medical history section, as well as exception criteria for alteplase and thrombectomy delay related to PPE and suspected COVID positive patients. We expect these updates to go live April 11th. We will continuously evaluate additional changes for recognition in 2020 that will allow for the appropriate adjustments you all are making in patient care. The American Heart Association has also committed $2.5 million to fund fast-tracked heart and brain-focused scientific research of COVID-19 through the initiative called COVID-19 and its Cardiovascular Impact Rapid Response Grant. The association will fund one national coordinating center along with at least 10 project grants of $100,000 each. Due to the critical need, applications for this funding were due this last Monday, and we hope that some of your organizations applied. We will announce awardees in early May and have projects underway by June. Last week, the American Heart Association made the announcement that we will be la launching a new registry. The COVID-19 Cardiovascular Disease Registry, powered by Get With The Guidelines, is expected to go live in early May. 
The registry was created to better understand clinical treatment patterns and variations, including collection of cardiac biomarkers and cardiovascular outcomes in hospitalized COVID-19 patients across the nation. The registry will focus on real-time granular data from acute care hospitals to better help clinicians and researchers understand and provide feedback to healthcare organizations on how to best treat COVID-19 patients. Facilities who enroll in the registry should have strong lab protocols in place for collecting cardiac labs and have the capacity to enter all hospitalized COVID patients. At this time, there's no fee associated with participation. If you believe your site's a candidate for this registry, please reach out to me directly and you'll see my email address there on the screen. Remember, you'll also be getting these slides, so you'll be able to pull it from the slides after the call. We recognize that CPR training in this environment is uh, maybe a challenge. Because of this, all expiring provider and instructor CPR cards have been given a 120-day extension. We'll continue to evaluate additional appropriate extensions. If your facility is doing traditional instructor-led CPR training and your training department is struggling, RQI Partners, which is an AHA and Laredal collaboration, has a free solution that will help you maintain credentials and skills during this time. Please encourage your training center partners to contact Allie Bateman if this is of interest and you'll see Allie's email address on the screen. Most of you are also reporting significant declines in your stroke volume since the pandemic started. We know that with quarantines enacted all over the country, patients are hesitating to seek life-saving treatment for heart attack and stroke. To help, the American Heart Association has developed materials for you to use in any way that you see fit, encouraging patients to call 911 if they're experiencing symptoms of heart attack or stroke. These materials will be emailed to all registrants at the conclusion of the call with the slides. Please share them broadly on your social media channels as well as through all of your, your circles of influence. We've also launched multiple websites on heart.org to help you navigate the environment. There are curated resources, a compendium for healthcare professionals that has lots of publications and a newsroom. The resource I wanna highlight is hospitalnetwork.heart.org. We expect this site to relaunch this week, and it'll, this will be an appropriate place for all of you to share protocols that you've developed, policies that you've developed um, for heart attack and stroke patients in response to COVID-19. So at this time, I'm happy to introduce you to your co-hosts for the rest of the call. Although their resumes are, are very long and impressive, I will just share with you today that Dr. Stephen Warrack is the chair of the American Heart Association's Southwest Stroke Committee, and Dr. David Wheeler is the president-elect of the AHA's Southwest Board of Directors and past chair of the Stroke Committee. Thank you so much to both of you for being here today uh, to lead the conversation. Dr. Warrack, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you to the American Heart Association, as always, for supporting uh, heart and stroke care. Um, I, what, the way we wanted to organize this, because we want to hear from you all, um, I'm going to begin by touching on some issues I think all of our, we've all dealt with at our stroke centers, um, give an example of um, our response or the debate that's going on then turn it over to Dr. Wheeler to share his experiences and lead the discussion. And we hope to have a good discussion where, where we can share ideas and suggestions and solutions. Um, I'm gonna to touch briefly on four, four issues. One of the, before I get there, I think you noticed on the map that Stephanie showed is our Southwest region looks to be the last <laughs> frontier, having a lot of rural and frontier areas. Um, are um, where the volumes are not as great as other regions. The current projections are that the peak will happen in two to three weeks, although the projected peak for Colorado is actually today by the uh, IHME um, group. Um, the, uh, if there's any good news, it's that in the projections, um, uh, by and large, the hospital bed capacity is not expected to be exceeded by the projected number of cases. Nonetheless, we're all gonna have a lot of cases. Um, these are projections that are probably subject to a, a change as 
as things happen. So um, if you've looked at those, those uh, graphs, there's a wide confidence interval. Uh, so um, I can say there's still a lot of uncertainty about uh, where this is going. So we're all preparing for the worst case scenario. Um, so four things I wanna mention. One, um, and maybe these are documents that Stephanie could share if, if there's interest. Um, the um, a recent publication called uh, Optimist, which uh, proposed a modified uh, post-thrombolytic monitoring regimen in order for to keep uh, patients out of ICU in the first 24 hours after getting thrombolysis in the in the low risk patients, and these tend to be those that had uh, NI scores of uh, of 10 or less and didn't have any other high risk predictors of uh, didn't have any other need for for being in an, an ICU. Um, and if we are in our system. We're currently um, adapting to that um, to get those types of patients uh, admitted to med surge floors. It involves some um, nursing education and retraining at, at certain points, but also having a backup plan for for um, being able to do a. Uh, higher frequency of neuro checks, but not the Q1 hour times 24 would be, the proposal is Q2 hours for times four, then Q4 hours in those low risk patients. Um, I think by now, most of us have seen or heard of the, the recommendations of the Society for Neurointerventional Surgery with regard to uh, intubating patients that are COVID positive or patients under investigation uh, or unknown COVID status, which is really a PUI, uh, to routinely intubate them prior to uh, taking patients to the IR suite in, in thrombectomy cases. And um, we've adapted that policy. I think several national hospital networks are adapting uh, somewhat similar policies, and we can talk about specific implementations as, as the discussion goes on. Uh, then uh, a, a paper that came out recently, which is a proposal for a so-called protected code stroke, which goes through an algorithm in those higher risk patients, the, uh, the COVID positive or COVID suspected, the PUIs or, or status unknown, which of course for, for stroke, it's quite common um, patients uh, come in and are unable to give a history, which is how we typically screen out uh, uh, suspected COVID. So those are automatically being in the, in the PUI category. So in this, uh, this paper that was recently published in Stroke, um, a, um, a algorithm is proposed uh, with regard to uh, which, which patients um, should be uh, considered for a protected code stroke and, and what kind of protective equipment we should be uh, using for that. I think in that algorithm, as well as uh, um, in other situations for, for neurologic uh, consultation in, in our hospitals and I know many other places, in order to reduce the number of uh, neurologists going into a room, especially for emergency consultations, reduce potential exposures, reduce, reduce the use of personal protective equipment, uh, we are, we've gone to an algorithm where the attending and the senior most resident uh, goes in and sees the patient uh, rather than a, a whole team of medical students and residents. And then, um, and then I'd like to talk about the use of um, telemedicine. As you all know, uh, CMS has uh, temporarily waived a lot of the requirements in terms of um, uh, encrypted, encrypted, sorry, um, uh, technologies. So use of FaceTime is 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 permissible. The question then comes is uh, twofold: um, in whom do we do telestrokes? Even like now during day shift, where you're assigned to the hospital and somebody comes into the emergency department. I know from talking to colleagues around the country where their hospitals have, um, have surged and the ERs are really busy, they're doing teleconsults 
on stroke and other neuro in the emergency department, even when they're physically in the hospital, just in order to uh, reduce ED traffic, reduce use of uh, PPE, and reduce the risk to, to, to everyone. But here we are, as I said, most of our region, um, the surge hasn't yet happened. The peak is a couple of weeks away. At what point do you make the decision we should be moving to only doing teleconsults? Or do you ever make the decision to only do teleconsults? Had a long discussion with our, our uh, neurology group this morning on that, uh, on that very topic with no, no final answer yet. Um, my proposal was let's we got it to a great extent by what our emergency department medical directors and CMOs tell us about the, the uh, their desire to reduce ED traffic and the use of PPE. So those are four topics. I mean, you may have other other really important issues to bring up too, and please do. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wheeler to further comment and open up for discussion. Thank you, Steve. Um, I think that was a, a really nice summary of the of the general topics that that uh, we had discussed ahead of time, and and feel like would make uh, good grounds for conversation amongst us today. Uh, I'll, I guess I just want to throw out a few a few thoughts from the rural perspective. Uh, I am I'm in Casper, Wyoming, uh, and the director of our stroke program here, which uh, provides telestroke services for a handful of hospitals in the in the northern half of Wyoming. Um, we, in our state, we so far have just over 220 cases of COVID, uh, just a handful of people in the hospital. Uh, our hospital is has not yet seen a significant uptick in COVID cases. Uh, so we have a lot of empty beds. We have a lot of uh, available resources and we continue to work diligently to to increase uh, our our supplies and make sure everybody's ready to go, and in this in this time we've had um, uh, a good amount of time to think about how we'll restructure our approach to acute stroke care. Um, so, uh, as Steve mentioned, the the models show uh, areas like ours uh, reaching the apex of cases in something like two to three weeks, uh, and models suggest that we won't run out of hospital beds, um, but I would I would echo Steve's concern that the, the models uh, are are have a lot of statistical uncertainty in them um, and the degree of uncertainty increases drastically as the population that you're dealing with gets smaller. So I don't have a ton of faith in the models for Wyoming. And I'm hearing from folks in Colorado that the models are not accurately reflecting what's happening in the hospitals there either. Uh, and so my my feeling is that we should continue to prepare for the worst possibilities. Uh, and and I feel strongly that we would be better being dramatically over prepared. Um, and then uh, if we look like if we look silly because we had too many ventilators or too many beds available, then that's fine by me. Uh, I'm much more concerned that the opposite is going to happen. Um, we are um, in constant debate with our political leaders here about the degree to which we've locked down movement in our state. We do not have a statewide shelter in place order. And while uh, schools and many businesses have been ordered to be closed, a lot of uh, what most people would consider non-necessary businesses continue to be conducted. A lot of people are still out and about in Wyoming. And there's a lot of social gatherings still going on. Uh, and my concern is that the models that are being shown to us um, uh, assume that uh, adequate social distancing has been in place already for at least one week. And, and I would say that that has not been the case in Wyoming. And therefore, I think our surge is going to be worse than predicted. So, um, in terms of things we're doing to prepare for stroke care, we're adopting a number of the, of the um, uh, changes to, to procedure that Steve's already outlined. So, we are um, going to start uh, putting our, our uh, TPA and post thrombectomy cases. Uh, on the neuro floor rather than in the ICU. We'll try to staff them at one to one or, or two to one as, as we have nurses available to do so. And we'll try to try to stick with the guidelines until we get too busy to do that. And then we'll probably relax the, the frequency of neuro checks if we get that busy. Um, one of the biggest challenges I think that we in rural settings are gonna face, um, even if we don't run out of hospital beds, is that if we lose our healthcare providers to 
to COVID or other other uh, problems that we don't have any depth at any one position. So for, for our entire stroke program and outpatient neurology program, we have three doctors um, and that's it. And there's nobody to replace us if one of us gets sick. Um, we made the decision two weeks ago to close our outpatient practice to in-person visits. So we've gone 100% telemed and it's going fabulously well. Uh, we're not making very much money. We're definitely not covering our expenses, but I think we're providing adequate um, continuity of care for our patients that need it. Uh, and we're preserving the health of our staff and our doctors so that we're able to respond to uh, uh, increasing number of emergencies as they occur. Um, with respect to acute stroke care, we of course already do telestroke with our with our remote with our spoke facilities, and we've worked with them to uh, be much more particular about which patients get transported and which patients can be safely cared for in their home facilities. Uh, so early on, we adopted a, a rigorous uh, uh, screening examination to try to decide whether these, a patient was likely to have COVID or not, and generally avoiding transferring patients that 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 were suspicious, even if they would normally need a somewhat higher level of care. If they didn't need urgent intervention like thrombectomy or surgery, uh, we would work with those facilities to keep them in place. And to facilitate that, we've extended our, our telestroke coverage to include uh, ongoing uh, inpatient care and support of the hospitalists and ICU teams at those other facilities so that our neurologists are available either by either by Zoom or, or FaceTime or telephone as needed. We continue to increase the availability of those services going forward. With all that being said, uh, it's been the quietest month of my of my professional career so far. Uh, we've seen almost no strokes in the past month, and uh, I don't know if that's going to keep up. I don't know if those patients are just having their strokes at home. I don't know if strokes are less frequent because people are living a different life right now. But whatever the cause, we're a lot less busy than we used to be. As is the hospital in general, it's it's pretty empty here as we all kind of just wait for the worst to come. So I'm very excited about this conversation and um, expect to do a lot of listening and learning from people who are already uh, dealing with, with surges in their own hospitals and, and I look forward to this conversation. So thanks very much, guys. Questions? Yeah, Dr. Green, for you there, David, on the chat, if you can see it. You. Are your outpatient telehealth visits being done with all follow-up patients, or are you doing new patients as well? So we are we are doing um, uh, some of both. We started out with the idea that it would just be appropriate for follow-up patients, um, but as the number of new patient referrals started to stack up into the dozens and then scores and now hundreds, uh, we decided that we couldn't just put everybody off for for months to be seen. And so we're we're seeing a lot of new patients. Um, Many of them, I, I'm feeling that we can adequately address their needs on those on those initial visits with plans to do more comprehensive examination once we can get them into the office. The more challenging ones are what to do with folks who need MRIs or lumbar punctures or EEGs or EMGs, none of which we're, we're doing in, in the absence of an emergency. And so uh, I still feel like there's value in seeing those patients uh, at their initial visit uh, remotely and then putting them on a high priority list to be seen in person and get those studies done just as soon as we can reopen our offices, which I'm hoping will be sometime in June, but we're definitely playing that by ear. I invite people to come off mute and ask questions, but please identify yourself and where you're from. Can you do that? Or give us advice. How are, how are, how are your centers handling this situation? Are you preparing? When do you when do you start doing things like all telemedicine and patient consults, if you do that? Dr. Swark and Wheeler, there's a message in the chat. Has anyone gone to modified monitoring protocol for post alta place to go to lower levels of care? And um, I guess that that's what you were addressing in the Optimist study, but has anyone incorporated that already? Um, we are actively planning, and I think we're gonna pilot it our busiest comprehensive center next week and then probably uh, roll it out to the rest of our hospitals. I mean, again, we haven't we haven't seen the surge yet, so it's part of being ready. But we also that's it's like David says and like everybody, we've seen a lot fewer cases. So um, our, our census and our thrombolysis cases have been very, very reduced recently. 
But, let, but let's ask uh, the others on the phone. Has anyone implemented that uh, protocol yet? Hi, it's Jeannie Luciano from the American Heart Association, and I'm, um, I work with National. I'm the senior manager for stroke and AFib, but I am actually located outside of Philadelphia. So I'm in the, um, the Northeast group with the 200,000 plus, and um, I've been in contact with a lot of people nationally, and uh, particularly in New England and in New York, a lot of sites are looking at patients who are going to units that are not familiar with taking care of the stroke patients because their ICUs are overwhelmed. And um, a lot of them are looking at modification of their vital signs and using the Optimus protocol as sort of a framework to help them do that and make the decision. And obviously looking at it on an individual patient patient basis. But um, so it is it is being utilized a lot in that area. There they are meeting challenges with um, being able to having getting nurses on board with how to monitor the, the stroke patient in units that aren't familiar with that. But, um, to give you some insights from the Northeast. There's there's several comments coming in, and for the benefit of the folks on the phone, I would I'll just read out a couple of them. So at the University of Colorado, they're uh, moving patients uh, TPA patients out of the ICU after eight hours in order to. Um, increased bed availability there. Uh, in Waco, they're expanding telemedicine uh, in the emergency department for, for, for all strokes, not just code strokes, uh, specifically with the intention of identifying patients that can be discharged and followed up outpatient as opposed to needing to be admitted to the hospital, especially for TIAs or subacute strokes. Um, Another comment that uh, efforts are underway to, to facilitate moving patients out of the ICU earlier than 24 hours. Um, Leanne Creighton asks, how patients who have no or limited access to technology are receiving follow-up care? Um, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that because that definitely applies to a, a fairly substantial subset of our population, although I'm, I'm surprised sometimes by, by the uh, the ability of some of our patients to to effectively utilize the tools that we offer them. Um, so really anybody with at least 4G service and a smartphone can take advantage of, of uh, two-way audiovisual connections. Um, and and programs like Zoom and, and Skype make it pretty simple to get that up and running on their phones. Um, that being said, uh, the it is currently um, uh, appropriate to uh, engage in and bill for telehealth services using telephone only, at least for Medicaid or in Medicaid services and a lot of private payers are following suit. Uh, so, so during the, the pandemic, if, if you can reasonably achieve your goals with the patient and safely deliver care using audio only, that is acceptable and a billable procedure uh, using the same levels of service that you normally bill for in the GT modifier. Um, I would suggest adding a statement in your in your uh, um, note about the patient indicating that you used uh, audio only and the reasons for that um, being the, the the challenges of the patient to to get video up and running. Um, but but I am finding that a lot of people you would expect not to be able to use use the services are actually doing great with it, including lots of our older patients, our patients living on the reservation, um, um, people who uh, are. Or you think would be too poor to have access to computers or internet, or finding ways to to get online, and I think that's because, partly because you know this is also how people are socializing and maintaining contacts with their family, and so folks' familiarity with these tools is is already pretty high, and and in fact I I would say our patients are more experienced with this than most of my physician colleagues are. Just a reminder to folks: if you're on the phone, you can unmute by hitting star six. And star six again to to mute. So 
Hi, this is Flannery with the AHA. Um, just wanted to share uh, some of the conversation that um, we had in a webinar last week with Northeast was talking about changes to triage um, protocols. So I'm wondering if anybody has any um, questions about that or practices they want to share with the group about that. Flannery, this is Jeannie, and I can, I can elaborate on that as well. Um, some patients are being triaged in tents, and um, is anybody doing anything specific to educate the additional triage people that are being um, incorporated in any specific tools you're using to help them identify stroke patients? Uh, this is Michelle Patterson from San Antonio. We're also using a tent to screen outside of our ED. It is our same triage and ED staff, so that did not require any additional uh, training for that for those members. And then the patient will go directly from there back to um, a specific area outside of the ED and also for immediate imaging. This is uh, Verna Giannis. We lost your audio there. If you if you want to state what you were trying to state. While she's working on that, there's a question in the chat as to how comprehensive stroke centers are screening uh, patients requested for transfer from lower acuity hospitals. Um, other, so for us, you know, other than asking questions about about uh, COVID symptoms, we don't have anything particular. Um, so I'd love to hear from others who are more actively engaged in that kind of uh, triage assessments as to as to how they're working through this. Hi, this is Bonnie from San Antonio. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Bonnie. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so what we're doing, because we receive a lot of patients, which we've also seen an, a drop in our transfer in patients, but what we're doing is our patient placement center is screening every patient for COVID, for COVID symptoms, and if they show a possibility with the COVID, then they do a further respiratory panel assessment on that patient, um, and if they are a person under investigation, then whatever team members will be caring for that patient upon arrival, everybody is made aware. That way there's uh, no compromise when the patient arrives. So, so when, you, when you're treating a patient under investigation, everybody wears uh, full PPE and 95s and over covering masks, or, or do you take it further than that? That's what you just described is what we're doing. So communication obviously is very, very important in those situations. I had another question actually not related to AltaPlace, but related to mechanical thrombectomies and if anybody has had to change their procedures around mechanical thrombectomies and or receiving patients, um, transfer in patients, just changing how they receive them if they were uh, coming in through their ED, because we've had to change ours. Um, and with the surge, we may have to even change it again if there is a surge. Can you talk a little bit about what you've had to change with your current process? Sure, absolutely. So all of our transfer inpatients for that were potential mechanical thrombectomies were coming into our ED. We had a specific room. It was a room that is owned by radiology. And so the patient landed there and a neuro ICU nurse would go down, meet that patient, and then take them either for additional scans or do their assessments, get them prepared to go to the IR suite. Um, because that is COVID station right now, um, and also because they blocked off that room, for COVID patients, now they're having to go directly up to 
the neuro ICU and be received up there, even if additional scans are required, which of course is going to affect our door to groin times because our ICU is up on the 10th floor and the ED is on the first floor. And imaging is um, down in our sublevel too. So there's a lot of patient transportation with that. Um, we have not had a COVID positive patient or a person under investigation that was a transfer in from mechanical thrombectomy, but for our normal mechanicals, we have had to change that process. And we're looking one step further of what happens in the next couple, two, three weeks, if there is a surge and our neuro ICU is full, where do they go then? And uh, where, where are we gonna put those patients? Where are they going to land? And people meet them. So I can share some of the conversation we had with the Northeast group. Um, a lot of the conversations surrounded about like uh, where they are intubating patients. So, um, you know, a lot of centers are using intubation teams and where, where they are intubating patients so that they're not having aerialization in the IR suite. Um, I haven't heard uh, as much around, you know, your process of redirecting a patient. And I know a lot of centers use the model that you, you were talking about um, of having the ICU nurse meet the patient. Has anyone else modified their arrival for patients who are going to thrombectomy? Anyone can come off mute and discuss that. We've done the same thing with the, you know, a COVID intubation team in a negative pressure room in the, in the emergency department, you know, resuscitation room and the main trauma room where stroke codes go. So, um, that's been the main change is the, the intubation team and then those increased criteria because generally our interventionalists don't intubate, but now we will, we haven't had a case qualified yet, we will if it's uh, COVID positive or a PUI. Yeah, this is Torsten from, uh, this is Torsten from UNMH in, in New Mexico. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, so we have a, we just talked about it the other day in our leader, stroke leadership meeting. Uh, we do want to significantly lower our thresholds for ED intubations for IR patients. Uh, the challenges came up for us was a couple. One was um, that we need now an RT or an osteology uh, to transport the patient, help transport the patient when they're on a vent. Uh, the other thing was that we need to use that vent that we, um, <clears throat> that we intubate the patient with, uh, stay in the IR because uh, we don't want to change circuit, uh, then we aerosolize the room again or initially. And so we just have some small uh, uh, log logistical challenges here, but basically we want to start intubating them in the ED. Thank you. This is Michelle in San Antonio. We are, we have also not really changed anything. Um, I'll just agree with the comments that have been made. Our biggest plan is to intubate um, prior to going to the IR if they're either unknown, under investigation, or known to be COVID positive. There's a question in the chat about will the get with guidelines time goals be adjusted to account for COVID-19 screening? And the answer is yes. We've already put, um, uh, the extended time for um, additional PPE um, into the tool. It should be coming out within the next, I guess, about two weeks. And those patients who will require extended time for PPE are going to um, be excluded from the time metrics. So they will, and it will not be held against you um, time-wise. And I just want to say also, I ran data last week nationwide to kind of get a sense because we are hearing across the board that people seem to have about a 50% drop in their stroke volume. And um, I ran data and understanding that stroke data doesn't go in real time. So it's, it's just really a sampling, but there's already um, close to 20,000 records and get with the guidelines for March of 2020. Um, the good news is, is what you guys are doing 
and what you have done over the years to um, get your centers to treat people fast is still working despite what's going on in the nation. Um, it appears that um, people are still treating patients and you're still treating patients in a real, actually the numbers are consistent with what they were pre-COVID. And once again, knowing that we're gonna see more data within the next couple months. So, can you hear me? This is Brenda from Galveston, uh, UTMB. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I have a question, two, a couple of things. One is, is that we're doing the tents outside and um, the nurses are gowning up in their PPE with everything and they are doing the screening. They're going to start the rapid testing probably like in another week or so because UTMB has their own testing kits that they created for the patients. So the biggest thing that the nurses are, are feeling is that yes, they've been trained um, to be able to, you know, neuro, um, neuro check a patient for stroke and things like that. But then there's some crossover with, um, is a patient having stroke-like symptoms versus is a patient having COVID symptoms? Because now that the, the new data is coming out as far as like the virology of the actual COVID isn't any more about the cough, the fever only. Now patients are coming in saying, I might have dizziness. I might have some, like 39% of the patients, I read an article the other day that said 39% of the patients may have neurological symptoms as well. It came out from the AHA. So it wasn't uh, published all the way into there. So that's kind of disturbing that whether or not are they missing the patients and their nurses are also concerned if they're missing the patients, which we won't know that information until they actually leave. So that's one thing. And two is, the other part of that is, I know our census has dropped. So one, it bothers me is patients already don't come in in the time period when they're having strokes. And I know that because I've been doing this for six years and so it's uh, the data doesn't change no matter how many times you go out to community events, no matter how many times you tell patients come in if you have these symptoms, they just don't come in. So are they having strokes at home by themselves? Are they afraid to come in because they're afraid that now they're told stay home? So, and there was one recently, uh, I was told like a family member that was like, oh, he was having, I hate the word, many strokes um, at home for two weeks and then he went and had um, he went and had um, a, a major stroke um, two weeks later. So I mean that's what bothers me too. So I know the census has dropped. So in March you probably they're entering the data now, but you're going to see it at the end of March and April is really going to be a, a, an indicator as well because for us, I could see March my numbers were February my numbers were like 62. And in March, they were 42. So it is like a 20 patient difference. That's just in the stroke and ischemic, I mean, stroke and uh, bleeds, hemorrhagic, not including the TIA. So um, I, I know that's coming. So those are some of my concerns is, are they having strokes at home? And then how do the nurses know actually to assess for the stroke patient when they're actually coming in? I think the stroke screen is the same. Your question, the challenge is neurologic symptoms raise your suspicion for COVID is a really good one and uh, tough to answer. I, I think we're just learning the, whether or not there can be neurologic presentations of COVID and what that looks like. I think from the volume um, standpoint, yes, we, you know, we're, we're all very concerned about the people, you know, even the sites that say, say their volume has dropped. They said they're, they're seeing essentially no TIAs are presenting and um, that the patients who are coming in seem to be coming in later and they seem to be your more severe strokes. So, um, 
and we know that this is going to be ever evolving because we're as the you know the disease peaks throughout the country we'll see it uh, happen in different areas of the country and um I think uh, Stephanie had put on the, in the beginning there there are some initiatives from the American Heart Association. I keep saying, you know, it's just because COVID came to town doesn't mean we're not having strokes. We're still having strokes, and patients are hearing messages everywhere from the news to like the CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield is doing commercials saying, you know, don't go to your emergency room. Like totally against everything we've told them forever. Um, so we're hoping, you know, whatever you can do to share the message on your social media, to share the message on your hospital's homepage that, you know, stroke and heart attack, they're seeing the same thing in cardiac, um, a decreased volume. So stroke and heart attack are still a medical emergency and we still want people to call 911. So yes, we are all absolutely concerned and we know that the, um, you know, the data at this point in time for the effect of what we're seeing with COVID is at incomplete at this point in time. And those materials will go out at the conclusion of this call so everyone can use them immediately. So one last thing also is I was interviewing a faculty to come down to work for us yesterday and, or, or Monday. And he was telling me that um, they're no longer giving Alta Place or TBA, they're giving because he said that um, he doesn't want to risk the nurses standing there for an hour to give it, um, which made sense because, you know, we do ask the nurses to sit there for an hour and, you know, monitor vital signs in the room with the patient doing neurovital signs as well. Um, and he just said that he didn't want to put anybody at more exposure that didn't need to be there the, for the, that right there in the patient's face doing it. And that he was from Illinois and he was mentioning to me that, um, that they're actually giving that instead of giving the Alta Place. So has anyone else changed their practice from giving Alta Place to giving the, um, the next place instead? Or I was just curious, um, has anybody heard of, it, ha heard of this? This was news to me because, of course, as long as I can remember, we've given Alta Place or TPA, um, but they're the same actually manufacturer is what I'm also hearing too. So, um, I, but it does make sense why expose someone longer than they need to be exposed also. So, I don't know. I can say this is Steve Work in, in Austin. <clears throat> It said nothing to do with COVID because we switched last September to only giving uh, Tenecta Place instead of Alta Place. And that was more for, for other positive workflow reasons, particularly for, for drip and ships. Um, but I think, I think it's an even more compelling reason now that, um, you know, with the, um, the inconvenience of having the drip for a lot of reasons, um, Interfering with a lot of the, the COVID related, related um, precautions. So we'll be interested to see if other, other centers make the move for that reason. Dr. Warwick, this is Nicole calling from uh, St. David's Medical Center. We have not gone to connect a place as of yet. But my question to you is this brings up a good point with the um, monitoring. It's still an alta play. I mean, it's still a thrombolytic. So, are y'all still doing the alta place protocol as far as the monitoring? Yeah, it's the same, same selection criteria, the same monitoring uh, program. Of course, you know the discussion about going to a limited, the this would be the optimist. Uh, we're going to do that. So, the only the way we think of it is the only thing that's different about stroke care is the is the drug and and the related how you deliver the drug. The selection criteria is the same, the monitoring is the same. We'll do that. Of course it's a five second bowl so that makes it different. Hey, this is Cassie Hello. from American Heart Association. Um, there was a question in the box regarding telemedicine coverage. Any suggestions on how to get that process in place and does it require a separate credentialing and billing process? Uh, 
Um, so the answer to the question would de depend on on where you want to do the service. So if you are hoping to do uh, emergency room coverage, you would need um, at least a telemedicine credential by the hospital where you're seeing the patient. Um, most hospitals in Wyoming and I'm sure elsewhere are utilizing expedited credentialing processes and uh, boards of medicine are doing um, waivers of the usual process and, and honoring licenses from other states. In terms of doing um, uh, neurology outpatient, uh, no special credential is required. Um, there is very little uh, skill that's needed that's different from what we usually do other than getting creative about how to achieve the, the physical exam maneuvers that, that you would find helpful in caring for your patient. Um, and, and then working out some sort of um, uh, scheduling process with your staff to, to make sure that you know you and the patient both know when you're supposed to meet and that you have um, have a uh, uh, an encounter set up in your EHR. Uh, outside of that, um, there's there's nothing else that's required, and all major payers at this point are covering those services at the same rate that they would pay for inpatient visits, uh, and and most of them are also waiving basic documentation requirements. So you can bill based on uh, duration of service or complexity of medical decision making without worrying about um, medical, social, um, family histories, things like that. So we're focusing our documentation on, on a good HPI, a review of medications, and an assessment and plan. question in the chat as well about all of our stroke patients receive rehab evaluation during their inpatient or observation status admission. Have any other organizations altered their rehab services to a more selective group of patients instead of all? Um, I can start this off by saying that in the Northeast area, a lot of them are doing their initial assessment in person and then follow up assessments. They are using like telemedicine. They are um, doing them iPads essentially. Uh, has anyone else modified their rehab services? So we're doing the same inpatient assessments, although the uh, representatives from our rehab hospital are not physically coming to the facility anymore. So they're just doing uh, telephone or telemed evaluations to decide to help us decide and screen patients. Um, and then on top of that, we are very rapidly um, discharging patients home at, once it's clear that they're once they're stable and it's clear that they don't need rehab. They're they're on their way with uh, with uh, prescriptions for outpatient therapies. Follow up the question about um, telemedicine again. Has anybody gone to or have plans to go to exclusively? Uh, telemedicine assessment for code strokes, even code strokes that are in a, a treatable window. We're ready for that at, at Wyoming Medical Center, but we haven't instituted it yet. Um, but we have one of our telestroke carts in our in our uh, spoke, sorry, in our hub ER, which we can utilize in that way. My plan would be if if the doctor who's uh, on call with is needing to quarantine, um, that would be the way to keep the process moving. Um, but if it gets to the point where the ER is just a busy and unnecessarily dangerous place for the neurologist to be for routine stroke evaluations, we have that capacity and I think it may be useful for us. Um, the, there's also a question about, about the uh, equipment needed to do telehealth and telestroke. For telehealth visits in the outpatient setting, no special equipment is needed. You just need a webcam uh, and or a smartphone um, and nothing else is required. Uh, for inpatient services, for an inpatient, you could do the same thing, um, uh, although you'd wanna make sure that your hospital administration is comfortable with that approach in your medical executive committee. Um, <clears throat> for uh, emergency department visits, uh, you absolutely could use the same technology, but a lot of us have set up uh, telestroke systems already that have uh, various types of robots in place, um, but if that's not in place yet and you're uh, credentialed to provide ER coverage, there's no reason you couldn't use uh, a pair of cell phones to provide a two-way audio-visual connection with the patient to enhance your evaluations and bill for that service. And I, I don't know if I mentioned previously, but 
but you patients can be seen in their homes. I've done uh, um, outpatient visits with patients in their home studies, in their bedrooms, in their work trucks, in their family car, uh, in the parking lot outside of Walmart. Um, all of those are, are um, billable places of service now uh, using the, the place of service telehealth and, and all major payers will cover those services now. We're nothing if not flexible, right? Um, so uh, there's a question there from Bonnie about dosing for TNK protocol, please for non IR. So your endovascular patients and IR patients are different doses in which hospital is only given TNK since last year. I, we answered in the chat, but I'll say for, for everybody, um, we use the 0.25 milligrams per kilogram max of 25 milligrams for both LVOs and non LVOs, which uh, we chose that even before the recent comparison study came out at the uh, ISC based on uh, published meta analyses that indicated that, uh, that that looked like it was the preferred non inferiority dose, non inferior dose, uh, regardless of LVO or not, with perhaps less, less bleeding complications. There's a question, is anyone providing education to family via phone, telemed, since family members are not permitted in the hospital? I know that's happening a lot in the Northeast. They're doing a lot over the, the telephone and FaceTiming. Um, and I actually have a document that I will um, make sure that Stephanie has to send out to um, help to address some of the stressors. You think about the stressors our caregivers are dealing with who might have had um, resources in the house that they can't have now, or even personal resources, family members that would help them that they, they're not getting now. Plus the fact that one of the things identified in the Northeast was the fact that a lot of patients are who normally would be going to a skilled nursing facility or to a rehab are going home because of not being able to be discharged to those facilities. They're running into that. So um, I will make sure Stephanie has that document to send out to you as well. Just, you know, for your use if you need it. Um, I'm an educator in the hospital, so I have to get on the line or I have to do, however I may have to educate a family member and or patient in, in this environment. And we are doing, we rapidly here in West Texas put up telehealth for our gestational diabetics who are at high risk to develop the coronavirus as well. So what we normally would do would be a group session with them, which we are not doing. Um, we are sending out their packets free and sending them home at their house along with their equipment for testing their blood sugars and doing that. Um, for our patients that have stroke and diabetes and congestive heart failure, I am doing that in their room with them and putting their patient family member on the phone or if they can, doing a web conference with them. And if I need to get the tele-interpreter, I will get that as well and doing the best I can to sit there and educate everything I can with this. <clears throat> um, so, uh, and I go through the whole gamut, whether it's medication, whether it's storing insulin, whether it's dietary needs with congestive heart failure, because I'm the only educator for this hospital. There's 235 beds. Strong work. I mean, you. I, I was saying to somebody um, the other day, it's sort of regulatory versus reality, right? So we're all dealing with reality and how we can best serve our patients. So it sounds like you're doing a great job with that. Steve, do you want to answer the question as to why everybody is using TNK instead of TPA now? Um, 
don't know. I mean, I, I think I think going through you know our process, which took several months, I I think there there's kind of a reflex reluctance for two reasons. It's not FDA approved for that indication. Of course, Alta Place isn't FDA approved for three to four and a half hours, so there's that. And then I think people um, have a little bit of discomfort because it's not the 1A recommendation in the most recent guidelines. But I, you know, honestly, if you look at the, the data and there've been a couple of really good meta-analyses and now Campbell's study at the last ISC showing, um, you know, that the, the doses seem to be equivalent, if not a little safer 0.25. I, you know, I think it depends on how conservative you feel about it has to be a 1A guideline recommendation and how vulnerable you feel if, if uh, the inevitable happens and it will happen that you have a serious symptomatic hemorrhage that you'd be vulnerable to criticism or legal action. Um, that's the decision people would have to make. Uh, you know, we're, we presented some, maybe so we presented our first 50 cases at IFC, we're, we're trying to write that up um, pretty quickly over the next couple of weeks, our first 100 cases of uh, um, showing our experience. And um, in a nutshell, you know, it's, it's that even 100 is still a small number. Um, the, um, the, at least within hospital to discharge outcomes that's equivalent to out to place made a huge difference in our drip and ship times. We're saving a half hour to, to start the thrombectomy and drip and ship just because you don't have to mess around with the, the infusion, which a lot of ambulance companies would make. So to answer your question, um, uh, you know, I, I think we're the decision everybody's gonna have to make for their own system and their own level of comfort with um, going to what is now in the guidelines as an acceptable alternative throughout the place. Um, I will say that uh, you know we've we've done a satisfaction survey of our ED and nurse and uh, physician and nurse providers and uh, very high satisfaction, particularly the ED nurses. I appreciate the simplicity of it. So we're at time now. Uh, it's 1.30 Central, 1.32 Central, and 12.30 Mountain Time. So I want to make sure we're, we're respectful of everyone's time. Um, if you found this helpful, please reach out to us and uh, let us know if you'd like to do it again and have another open discussion. Um, thank you all for your participation. And, and Dr. Dr. Warrick and Dr. Wheeler, thank you so much. And I'll leave it to you to close up. Yeah, well, thank you all for joining and um, you know, we can keep the conversation and discussion going. Um, uh, I'm happy to have through Stephanie sharing my, my email information. Feel free to contact uh, or myself with uh, further questions and we can be of use in giving you advice. We're happy to do that. But we'd also like to hear um, you know, your ideas and comments. I think Stephanie's going to send out some materials, but um, this could be a, a good source for communicating back to this group any, any uh, summary of further suggestions after we get off the call. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, also, Stephanie, please feel free to share my email with, with the uh, follow-up that you sent to the participants here. I'd be happy to hear from anybody, and I would echo uh, you uh, ask of you all to share with us your ideas about whether this is helpful, what other topics we can cover together, um, or if, if you guys just want to get together and commiserate, I'd be I'd be down with that as well. So stay in touch, and uh, let's hopefully do this again before too much longer. Thanks so much, everybody.